this is tracking, what is this? Some Microbiology, sort of yeast cells. Yeah, but I can never say, I can never remember what this is called, but fluorescence. Oh, fluorescence. Okay. Biofluorescence? Uh, so it's some sort of uh, fluorescence here, and then you're tracking the, the brighter yeast, which are being consumed by some sort of uh, uh, like amoeba like or something. I don't know. Yeah. Who knows? We're not microbiologists. Yeah. So you'll get to, in the course, work with actual videos like that. We just thought that for the demo today, uh, live tracking would be more fun with webcams. So. And it'll allow, it'll allow us to interact with you if you have questions or you want to see us try something, uh, as long as it's not too, I don't know why I just offered that. Um, plus, uh, we are so much prettier than yeast cells. That's what my mother was always saying to me. Like, Megan, you're so much prettier than a yeast cell. So. That's nice of her. Yeah. Good mom. So we talked a little bit about detection. Now we're talking about tracking. What is the difference between them? Uh, well, detection is a crucial part of tracking. But I, as you saw in the video, detection is just saying, well, there's something there. There's some generic object there, right? It doesn't know, you know which one is which. As far as detection is concerned, uh, every time you get a new video frame, it's a completely different world, and everything in it is new. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, when you saw when I walked behind her, I was gone. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no notion of, oh, he's behind her, right? Tracking is what introduces that kind of notion. I mean, it's, it's, it's very intuitive to us, right? We all have object permanence after like some young age, I would imagine. Yeah. Uh, so when I walk behind a tree or I walk behind Megan, I, I go out of the room, you know I'm still somewhere in the world. Uh, I haven't just actually disappeared. And when I come out the other side from whatever I've gone behind, you don't think that I'm a new person. You know, that's still the same one that was moving there before. So I've brought this little diagram up. We go into a lot more detail about this, again, in the course. Uh, detection is the first step. What you also do is these three things in a, in a loop in tracking. So you predict where you expect something to be. In my case, when you saw me walk behind her, you probably assumed I was going to come out the other side. That's your prediction. So then when you detect me again on the other side, you assign that's me again, right? And that you update that in your mind. So that's roughly what this process is doing. Um, but you, know, you do it a lot better than computers do, but we have to try with computers. Yeah. And just uh, for those of you tuning in now, the course that we're referencing is part of the specialization on Coursera, Computer Vision for Engineering and Science. So when we say that course, we mean this specialization yes. and then the specific course we're talking about today uh, is Object tracking and motion detection with computer vision. Yeah, but there's other stuff in there that you'll find really interesting. If you're into computer vision, we do some machine learning, both for classification and object detection. We talk about features. There's lots of good stuff we won't have time to get into today, so check it out. So we've talked a lot about, the, or a little bit, about the theory of detection. I'd like it to be a little, and tracking, I'd like to be a little more concrete. So why can't we just track an ob why can't we just detect an object in every single frame like what's what do you get from tracking it what's well you know you get the object permanence but, but you also you know you might not see it every frame mm -hmm. and you might not see it perfectly every frame now the examples we're doing here are pretty simple right we've got a webcam five feet from us but you can imagine generally when you're tracking objects uh you know you might not see them perfectly you might not be using a purely visual camera either so you, you know you could get some detections that are actually uh you know not where you think the object should be uh, so detection's part of tracking. Let's talk about some of the other parts. We talked about the workflow. Let's make this a, a little more concrete. So let's say we are we have a video of some real world objects. So this is gonna be this is me here. This is Matt. So we've got a video, and in the video But remember that the computer doesn't really see this. You do, and you see it on the video display, but what the computer is seeing when it's detecting these things. It could be some sort of segmentation. Uh, if you know what segmentation is, it could be a deep you know, learning network is uh, a some abstract features in your deep learning network yeah. that says, "Oh, look, that's a person, and I think its approximate centroid is here." Right. So, the, bear in mind these are the real objects. So we know where they are, but this is you know the computer doesn't really know that. Yeah, the computer doesn't see the smileys. What it does see is the detection. So for the rest of this demo, we are going to be using these circular magnets for detections. So it's, it's, it can be not very good, it can be pretty good. For now, it's detected two people in this frame. So what happens next? So this is frame N, uh, and what we would have observed up until that point, I can do it on the right, is that maybe this one was moving uh, you know, with this kind of velocity here. And then that, that person, I guess we have assigned these ourselves, was moving like that. So the, track, the tracking algorithm then makes a prediction about where we expect them to be. So I'm going to be using, for predictions, I'm going to be using these little squares. And then for the tracks itself, I'm going to be using the big squares. 
So when I say a track, what is a track? Uh, track is the uh, computer's notion of the object persisting over time. OK. So objects over time, tracks. Mm -hmm. So if they make a prediction, you've been moving, your computer thinks you're probably going to keep moving, right? Yes. Seems fair. OK, so it's made some predictions. And now what's going to happen is uh, these things are actually going to move somewhere, and maybe not exactly where we predicted. And then we detect them again somewhere, maybe not exactly where they are. So the tracking algorithm also takes into account that there's uncertainty in both the detection and the uh, estimate of where it will be. So, so that yeah. uncertainty is going to depend on a number of factors, right? Like it's going to depend on how good your detection is. Yeah. So if you if you know you have like super high quality sensors, you might say, hey, I trust them. As long as I get a detection from it, I think that's basically almost exactly where it is. Sometimes you might think my detector is really bad right now. It's so noisy. I don't know where the thing is. I'm going to trust my prediction. So that's, that's the opposite. Yeah, so that would be a really this bad This would be a good detection. detector and a really terrible prediction. <laughs> OK, so but if you have a really good prediction, it would be more like this, right? Yeah. So what it does is it takes both of those uncertainties into account. Uh, and through the magic of some sort of state estimation, and, and most of the time we use a Kalman filter, but you can use other ones, uh, nonlinear uh, estimators as well. And you don't know the details, need to know the details of that algorithm for this discussion. We're just saying uh, we are using yeah. an algorithm. You can swap out your own algorithm if it works best. We will be using Kalman filter here. Yeah, and you'll, you'll learn a little bit more about that in the course. Uh, MATLAB makes it pretty easy to do tracking, uh, even without being an expert in state estimation, but it helps to know a little bit about it. Yeah. All right. So you yeah. have a prediction, you have a detection, and your track should be somewhere in the middle? Uh, yeah, I mean, you could think of it like that as roughly speaking, some sort of weighted average of the two based on uh, you know, your, your various assumed uncertainties. So now this is where we believe these objects are. This is the computer believes that I'm here and Megan is, is there. Okay. And then this process just repeats over and over again, right? All right. So what happens if something we stood in front of each other? a little bit earlier and the detection was lost, uh, what happens then to these detections? So I think one person gets detected, the other person's hidden, we lost the detection. What happens to the tracks then? Uh, so well, we'll just leave out the, the estimation part, but there would have been estimated locations. There's only one um, detection, that's fine, because the tracks, there remember the, the tracks would always, be, where'd I, where, 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 which one was I again? Uh, you were. Which, oh, this track, you were, I think, right? Yeah, the, you were the blue cool dude. OK, but both of the tracks would have been updated to be basically here. right? So even though it, this is getting a little crowded, even though it's only detecting uh, me, or well, it doesn't know what it's detecting, right? it's a detection. Mm -hmm. And so this detection would get assigned to this track, blah, blah, blah. But the, her track still exists, even though we can't see her. Mm -hmm. And you'll, you'll see this when we demo this in a moment. That's a very important concept, because then as we keep moving, uh, I'm going to go this way. and. Maybe she's over here now, uh, and I get detected somewhere it's and somewhere. It's picked me up again. I've been redetected. Maybe you know, uh, maybe it even estimated she went further, and estimated I went where over there, and so then we get updated yet again, and that's where it believes we are. But these tracks are persistent over the, over time. Now there there are parameters you set to say like, hey, if 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 she disappears or I disappear for long enough. We'll actually delete the track out of our system, um, so if I and go that's like, a parameter you set, right? So, so if I go spend like ten times without a detection, it figures Megan's gone; she's no longer in the video. Yeah, that be a, that'd be the simplest way to do it is just say, hey, if, if if I don't see that object for a certain span of time, just assume it's gone forever, uh, and you can remake a new track if you see it again. But you'll assume it's gone. But then, if I'm gone for so long, it deletes my track. If I reappeared, I get a new track. Yeah, you'd be a new track at that point. OK, but that has to, you can set that to be as long as you like. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, what if, uh, where's our third face? So this say we're, be we're both being reliably tracked at this point. And then another, uh, well, we get a detection, not this one. We get some detection. some detection over here. Yeah. OK, and that, that may be coming from something, well, let's say we just get a detection and there's nothing actually there. So you know, you don't create a new track right away. So that's another thing that goes into these algorithms, which, which you know, we'll, maybe I should bring up the diagram again. Uh, basically, you, you set a lot of things in the assignment and update and prediction steps that make sure that this has to be there, and maybe two, three, maybe a certain number of times, 
And then you say, oh, that, that's an object. Like, I'm confident that's enough that track. there's really, if you want to put a and, well, goofy person there, there. there yes. if you do it long enough, your algorithm becomes confident. Like, that's not noise. That's not something weird happening. That's a real object there. And then at that point, after a set number of detections that kind of make sense, yeah. it gets assigned its own track. So now everybody's tracked. And I guess as you've as you've sort of seen and we've been hand waving through the assignment process is uh, it's well it's also done primarily for you in MATLAB but it's more or less done based spatially on you know which detections are closest to which existing tracks and so you know that's how you'd say well if I get a detection way over here that's either nothing or it will be a new track at some point right it's not it's not one of these two yeah. uh, so but then if I detect something here well I'd say that's close enough to be MAT yeah. uh, but if I if I was really over here actually. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say yeah, that. Yeah, you that never sign this to detection me. to this track because it, it doesn't make sense with what we predicted. It doesn't make sense with where the track is. It's too far away. So your algorithm gets pretty smart about knowing which detections go with which tracks based on the predictions. And again, this will be discussed in you know much more detail, and you get to actually tweak some of these parameters and move around, move them around, see what it does in uh, the course, which is part of the Computer Vision for Engineering Science Specialization. It's uh, part of the specialization, yes. And specifically, it is the, uh, well, I'll just scroll down to it. It is the third course, uh, Object Tracking and Motion Detection with Computer Vision. If you are not already familiar with the first two course topics, uh, or even if you are, there's probably still some interesting stuff in those as well. Uh, I mean. I, and while I'm plugging saying. us, uh, <laughs> you know, if, you, if you don't even, if you feel like, man, it's been forever since I've done image processing or I've never done image processing, we also have a specialization on image processing, yeah. uh, which I don't know. Some of those detection algorithms that we're talking about can just be image processing algorithms. For, for something like the uh, smiley face application, image processing would be really good at finding circles, at finding the difference between the sunglasses person and the <laughs> person. Um, because uh, just based on intensity, colors, all that sort, all that fun stuff. So, um, if you want to look at it more from an image processing perspective, you can find a lot of that good stuff in image processing for engineering and science. Absolutely. <laughs> I support that course board, so if you go there, you'll get to you know say hi to me in the discussion boards. But it also means that I've typed that title a hundred bazillion times. Uh, so we talked about the code that you'll get to use in. Uh, in the course, um, what can can we see an example of that? Can we see how all these fun <coughs> functions work in reality? Yeah. Uh, so code-wise, it's actually pretty simple. Uh, let me actually just make this larger. Maybe. You just control plus. Is that what does it? Yeah, that'll zoom in. Oh. Anyway, you see that for each frame, that's the, the run loop. We're running through each frame, in this case, of the webcam. In the course, yes. you'll be doing it from a recorded video. So yeah, we're getting frame information here. That's you know whatever. This is the, the algorithm you just saw. This is this thing, right? With these four blocks are basically done with these four lines of code here. Uh, so this is a detection function, which uh, you know, you'll learn how to do that, too. In fact, uh, in, it's in the same course, actually. You'll learn how to use. Uh, the same pre-trained deep learning network we're using right now mm -hmm. uh, to detect objects. Which is YOLO, for all of you curious. It's, yes, it's, you it's only look that. once. That's uh, awful. Uh, <laughs> I didn't name it. I know. Sorry to the creators of YOLO. We love your work. I'm not sorry. But <laughs> anyway, uh, predict <laughs> then you have a prediction function, which again, I'm not going to go into like all the details of it, but these three functions, if I scroll down, you know, they, they, there is quite a bit to them, um, but we go through all of this, basically every line of it in the course, and explain how, what you're doing, why you would do it, and you'll know how to tweak these parameters when, um, when you get there. And we did have a question from the chat about who is this aimed at, this demonstration and this course. Um, is it for basic learners? It asks if it's for kids. Um, I, think I, I think of myself as a child at heart, so that might explain the colorful magnets. Uh, but who should take um, this course? The course material itself is going to be a little bit more geared towards, uh, you know, like your college level uh, working professionals. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you don't have to be. We get people in high school, so if, if you want to take it and you're younger, that's perfectly fine. It's a little uh, ambitious. But though, the ambitious. course material, just to be clear, and, and no, nothing against our demo. I thought it was great. It's it, the course isn't like this demo. The course is a little more polished and professional. You know, 
So uh, it's just we thought it would be a little boring to show bring you to a live event to then show you a bunch of videos. So that's that's where the smiley faces came in. You'll get to do actual real world examples like. Uh, tracking pedestrians, tracking moving vehicles, oh, these yeah. sales. The examples in the course are much more applied to different fields. Yeah, I forgot to mention that you do the yeast cells as, as I showed, and I don't have a video of it right now pulled up, but the final project for the course is you actually uh, count the cars moving in different directions on the road outside of MathWorks campus, Yeah, uh, which is one of the applications where you need tracking, because if you detect it, well, you detect a car every frame, and you'd count several thousand cars yeah. every second, so that wouldn't be good. Uh, we have a, a really great question here about, um, speaking of image processing, but how do you handle the light effect when an object's moving? Like, things look different in different frames based on the lighting around it. Mm -hmm. So that can really mess with your detection algorithm, depending on how well trained it is and how prepared it is for the lighting. There's a couple yeah. things you can do. Sure. You can do image processing to kind of clean that up. But that's one of the nice things about tracking, is that if there's a flaw in your detection algorithm and you lose something, the track should still be able to handle that and should still be able to pick it up again when the detector yeah, goes like, yeah. there it is. So that, that is one of the main things about tracking, which we're not really showcasing here much uh, because, again, we're, we have a nice setup. We're in a studio. We're five mm -hmm. feet away from the camera. Uh, and our detector is, uh, you know, our detector is a, a neural network. So it's we're, very we're, good. We're overdoing it as far as that <laughs> is concerned. I mean, we won't have as many problems with lighting in that sense. But yeah, I mean, if you were using. Uh, basically, just if you were using image processing, lighting is going to be much more of a problem. It will still be a problem if you're using deep learning, um, but you can kind of uh, you well, can find ways to prepare your algorithm. Like you can, you can, yeah, you can train that. Uh, which you know, at some point in the future, we will have a course on that for you as well. But we do have, in terms of uh, more traditional machine learning, in <coughs> this computer vision specialization, there is a course on machine learning oh, for yeah. computer vision applications, and that includes training models to, you know, tell when the lighting is a little bit different and still be able to pick up what you're seeing. There's a great example for roadside safety of even when it's sunny in some pictures and cloudy in others, you should still be able to detect roadside conditions. Like, I think we use snow, if the, the road is covered in snow or not. Um, and so we do talk about that in the course, but it's a great question. All right. Uh, hi, I need to track the speed of people who are moving in a video. It should be, the output of the program should be like a rectangle covering the detected human and annotating the speed of the person detected. Uh, that's actually very easy to do with this. I'm not going to do it in real time because I probably, you know. Typing in I'd front of something. people is a dangerous uh, thing to do. But actually, yeah, the speed, um, and if you do our project, it's, it's not even Which just the project, that but uh, the part the of the project is actually getting the velocity of the cars to tell if they're moving east or westbound. Uh, as far as displaying that, there's a there's a function that dis you could easily it's insert object annotation or something, and you could just display this the observed speed. Now, there would be some nuance there that you because you're using a camera, you're not getting the, like the mile per hour speed. You'd have to have some have additional to calculations to convert your pixel velocity into something else if you really wanted to do that. But yeah, it's uh, you will in that course you put bounding boxes on things, you label them, you can annotate them however you like, and you absolutely are required to calculate the speed. Yeah. And that's something common filters are actually really good at. Is um, I mean, the, the common filter state is, is it includes the velocity yeah, uh, so. in this case. So. Great. So should uh, we do our demo? Let's do, let's do our demo. So before we just showed detection, now we're going to add in tracking. So uh, we're going to need some pedestrians. I think we're going to be the pedestrians because I have been walking successfully for several weeks now. She's gotten good at it. I've, gotten, I've been practicing for all, all of you out there. I've been practicing walking in a straight line. All right, let me get this down. Oh, so you see, it already knows that I am track 16. It knows who I am. If I move, I'm still going to be track 16. And what am I, 13? You're 13. You're unlucky. Uh, the reason, yeah, damn. The reason that we aren't number one and two in this case is because the, the code I have set up actually doesn't confirm tracks until so long. It, it's that process I talked about where um, you know, even after it says there's a track there, I still wait to display it until I'm more sure. Uh, so I guess while we were moving around and jostling things, it, it saw a few other things that w it wasn't confident enough in to yeah. display. It's but like, that might be a track, but I'm going to wait to make sure. And it correctly identified, like, yep, that's really Megan and Matt. So well okay. done, Algorithm. But so uh, the first thing that you see is, yes, it does tell us apart. We have different numbers. We've, we've been uh, numbered. 
Uh, mm -hmm. it, it does, it's not advanced enough to know our names, uh, but it does keep us, it does keep us uh, distinguished. Yeah. So now you'll see if we walk uh, behind each other oh. that we... Lost my detector, right? We should stay. Yeah, why am I lost now? Because we're too close to the camera, I think. Anyway. All right, okay, are you walking in front of me or behind? I'll, I'll go behind, or front. Okay. So we should stay the same track. I'm still 16. A little bit older. Huh? Nothing. <laughs> I know, it's my useful glow. All right, so um. we can do it again. And we should stay. Yep. Now, the, just to mention it, we can screw it up a little now. We are making a fairly simple assumption here that we have a constant velocity. That's the common filter we're using. It just assumes we have constant velocity. So we probably can get it to switch us if we like trick it. Oh, do no. weird things, but it might not. I mean, it's, it does a pretty good job anyway, but that's one of the things you have to take account of when you are doing this yourself is your motion model is actually a crucial component of uh, your ability to make accurate predictions. And you can change that. There's a lot of options out there um, for changing your motion models. We're using a simpler one because it works great for our application, but also because it's you know easy to talk about and explain in this kind of venue. But you can come up with whatever detection model works best for your data and whatever motion model. Like if you're working with very jerky motion, you're going to want a motion model that accommodates that. Uh, we've lost Matt. He's no longer here according to detection, but tracking still knows he's there. So and what is that doing though when it's drifting? So what happened oh, is I went way too fast. Yeah. So what happened is it lost the detection. It assumed he was going to continue at the motion that he was doing before. So when he was moving, like going like this with the blanket, it assumed he was going to keep moving. That's why the track drifted up. So when he did the blanket and yeah. covered himself really slowly. And even though we are using you know, a pretty good detector here, it's still you can see it's noisy, right? Yeah. There's some there's some jitter. But when you did um, it, you know, so it, slower, it does it if I go up fast. And but, but you could adjust that too. Yeah. But uh, basically, anyway, it finds me after I come back out from the towel, and it, and it's, it knows I'm the same person. The track thinks you're going to continue doing whatever you were doing when it when the detection lost you, and then when yeah. it finds the detection finds you again, it resets. Uh, I mean, yeah, and I should mention for for those of you out there who are you know experts in Kalman filtering, uh, yeah, if you have a more complicated model of your objects and you know inputs to them, uh, you know, you don't have to assume that it's going to keep doing what you saw last. You can, you may have more information and you can incorporate as much information as you want to into your uh, track motion model. Yeah. When I was we, still a speech researcher, we used a common filter to um, measure the motion of the parts of your throat and mouth to figure out what words people were saying. Nice. So there's a lot of wide ranging uses for this. And for the obstruction, it seems sort of silly for us to hide behind a beach towel. You know, we're basically playing peekaboo with the peekaboo with the computer. But that's you can imagine that would be really important if this were example in a dash cam, and yeah. they needed someone who you know if they had their coat up. Yeah, well, I lost. walk behind something like a bush here. Yeah. Uh, you want to you want to have me reappear again. You know, you want to you want to have some some notion that I uh, haven't disappeared completely, because just you know, because a pedestrian's behind a bush. There's still going to be a pedestrian, and they you want to know the pedestrian's there, so you're you know safe with your so car. You can activate the brakes. So you can activate the <laughs> brakes on the car, but also the idea of the track is it says if you're moving, you're probably going to continue moving. So the track will actually yeah, predict in a minute he's going to walk out from behind the bush. So the track correctly you predicted where I was going to be after I walked behind Matt. So <laughs> it could say like, hey, that pedestrian's walking towards the street. They walked behind an, a parked car. I think they're going to appear in the street. And so they still hit the brakes, even though they're not currently detecting the pedestrian. Yeah, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, and again, we have more you're questions. just tuning in. Ask questions. We love questions. Ooh, we've got some good ones. OK. Uh, what kind of algorithms do you use to track objects? Maybe MobileNet, DetectNet, YOLO, thanks. What do we use for detectors? Yeah. And, uh, where can, and where can they find these for MATLAB? Oh, well, there's several different ways to get the pre-trained detectors. Uh, we, we have different variations of YOLO in MATLAB. Uh, on the model, well, we have, I think, version 2 and 4 currently. Uh, 7 will be soon, I'm told. Uh, don't, you know, don't hold me to it. Uh, and uh, YOLO X is actually a very new uh, high-performance YOLO model that's currently available on the Model Hub. In fact, if you saw, I tried it out. I, I didn't use it for this demo, but uh, I did download it from the Model Hub. So let me show you that if I can remember how to get to it. 
what speed can you handle in real time? That's a, that's a good question here. So right now, we're actually using a GPU hooked up to the computer to do this real-time imaging. You can see that it's, there was almost no lag. This was all live over the stream. This wasn't, none of this is pre-recorded except for the yeast cell. We don't actually have yeast cells here. Um, so if you have a GPU with a webcam, it can be pretty much live. Uh, if you didn't have a GPU, if you just had your computer CPU, we tried that too. There was maybe like a second lag. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'm using uh, the, what we call the tiny version of YOLO. So it's, it's a smaller network. Uh, it's, it's a bit less resource hungry. I think YOLO X is act In fact, YOLO X runs the same. I, I also ran YOLO X on my PC uh, with no GPU. And you could tell, I mean, there was some there was some lag, but I mean, it wasn't like it didn't work. It's still pretty fast. And, uh, you know, a lot of what you want to do for tracking algorithms, it's actually going to be for pre-recorded videos, so it doesn't matter yeah, as right, much. Yeah. But it, it really just depends. If speed is more important to you, maybe use a smaller detector model. Um, if accuracy and, you know, fine-grained detail is more important to you, you might want to use one of the larger deep learning models. Uh, it's just a trade-off. But um, you can, even with fairly complicated and fairly accurate detection models and a CPU, you still get pretty fast results. I've, I've done it, and it's like a, maybe a second delay. So um, just going back to the person who asked about what models are available, I was showing the Model Hub. Uh, that's where you can go download some pre-trained models uh, that are not currently like completely part of the product, but they still will work within the product. and then. Uh, to get the ones that are kind of more fully integrated, uh, you just go to the doc pages and you can see there's, uh, well, I guess this isn't really listing them. But basically, we have uh, faster RCNN, various types of YOLO, and uh, SSD. So that we pretty much cover uh, the, the one major type of, uh, it's called two-stage detection, which is RCNN. And then we have the, the two popular single-stage detection methods, which are SSD and YOLO. You can also train your own detector, um, which we do show you how to do that? Um, uh, not yet. In image processing? Oh, you can't? We do not, we, not we, to we train, train an a object learning. detector. Oh, not for a video. Um, but you do train object detectors in course. Object detection. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Too. Okay, so it, in coursework, we already have on Coursera. We do show you how to do uh, like feature based machine learning uh, object detection. Yeah. Um, and then we will, at some point in the future, show you uh, how to train object detectors, uh, okay. your own. Uh, neural networks. Yeah. Um, can these uh, models work on external devices, such as uh, a Raspberry, Jettison, or NVIDIA, et cetera? Yes. Uh, we, it's, you, do, you do something called CodeGen in MATLAB. And, but basically, yes, you, you can deploy these models onto hardware. Uh, we have support packages for that. Uh, we actually do very well. There's a video in the um, course, too, about a little bit how that works for yeah. model deployment. Uh, and that's one of the other reasons for trading off. Like, maybe a larger model works great on MATLAB, but you need it to be really small so it can go on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, and then we'll talk about some of the trade offs of that for, like, yeah, let's, you know, why don't you train a smaller model? Um, and these models can run without internet connection. Uh, this mysterious Brandon Armstrong seems to have already answered that one. I, I don't know who that is. He, but, does, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, but yes. Uh, oh, sometimes he does. These models, once you have installed the model, uh, this can all run without internet connection. We weren't actually using the internet for any of our demo. That was all um, local on the machine. Yeah, correct? the the internet is only required to like download the initial model if you're getting it from the model hub. If you've installed MATLAB, it's already uh, well. No, it isn't. There's, I should. I guess I can show them that too. You may need to go to this thing called add-ons, and get add-ons. And then you will download, for example, the support package for. Uh, we also have a question about um, about whether you can try this stuff out for free. And if you take this course, it, it includes a free license with all of the packages you'll need for the duration of the course. So you can get a chance without you know paying for MATLAB to try out all this stuff for yourself. And so that's that's the beginning of each of our Coursera courses. There will be instructions for how to download and install MATLAB so that you can, you know, you don't have to already have MATLAB to do all the material in the course. OK, so I finally found one. As you can tell, I'm a great uh, search bar user. <laughs> uh, this is the V3. I haven't installed this one. I haven't installed the version 4. So you, all you'd do is you'd find this here, and then you'd, you'd 
click install. Mm -hmm. uh, the nice thing is, if you try to just use the functions in MATLAB, it'll prompt you to go to this page and install it. So you don't even have to search for it like I did. Uh, do you, we're getting questions about <coughs> the GPU and uh, how MATLAB will automatically detect and use compatible GPU if you had it. Do you want to show how you do that on the MATLAB command line, how you find out what GPU you're using? Just this, right? Yep. See, now we know all the information about our GPU. Uh, we hooked it up and automatically found it on the GPU device. We might have had to install a driver, but that has more to do with the GPU. Than yeah, you'll have to do it through the GPU drivers. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember if there's a, I don't remember if there's a support package for it. But again, it's it's very user friendly. Uh, if well, it's I it's the point. MATLAB side of it's automatic. If you are already using a GPU for gaming or anything on your computer, MATLAB should be able to find it. Um, what about detection in the Tesla and other cars? There's a bunch of things moving at the same time, and what type of hardware does it need? So what Teslas are doing, my understanding, is it's really similar to what we're doing today. Is um, These pre-trained models already have a lot of dis different objects in them. We didn't show that as much because there aren't that many objects in the video. Like we don't have, in the studio, we don't have a bicycle with us, we don't have a car, we don't have a dog. Right. Um, we could have brought some stuff, I suppose, but we yeah. didn't. Um, but it will automatically, the same algorithm we're using, will show like cyclist, pedestrian, backpack, dog. There's even some kind of like out there ones where it like it can, you know, it can detect like certain dishware, which yeah. hopefully no one is throwing dishware at your car, but if it if they were, you could detect it. So it has a lot of different types of things, which is important because, you know, maybe s you can expect cyclists to behave differently than pedestrians. Uh, so this is an so it'll get all these things basically. Uh, the the pre-trained networks that we have in MATLAB were all trained on the Coco data set. Uh, at least the YOLO ones were for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is your list of classes. Uh, it's, motorcycles, it's traffic lights, street signs. Pretty long. Snowboards probably won't come up. Carrots maybe not. But if they do, you'll be ready. Um, but yeah, you see a lot of things that you would find on the road that would be important. Mirrors is actually pretty useful to show if it's a pedestrian or a pedestrian in a mirror. That's really helpful. Um, and I, I did want to double check because I couldn't remember. It's been a while. If you had a support package for GPU uh, computing, and you don't, uh, mm -hmm. you install the graphics drivers for your GPU. Which, if you're already and, using the GPU, uh, you already, you already have. have it. If you have an external one like I did, you install drivers, plug it in, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, as soon as you do something where MATLAB can use a GPU, it will, unless you, for some reason, tell it not to. Yeah, you can tell it not to if you want to. <coughs> Ooh, this is a good question. Uh, MATLAB op offering a labeling tool. Yeah, MATLAB has a labeling tool. It's a very good labeling tool. Um, uh, I hear very good things about it. Brandon Armstrong loves it. <laughs> I actually am a big fan <laughs> of the labeling tool. I'm sort of dorky about it because I resisted labeling things for a really long time because I thought it would be a pain, and I spent a lot of time trying to figure out workarounds. And then when I actually did it, it took me like, I don't know, 35 minutes to label whatever 19 times 60 is. like a lot of images, and it was really, really fast. And so I wish I hadn't been putting it off. Um, that app for your information is in this apps menu here. And yeah. I think you're referring to the image labeler. We also yeah. have a video labeler, uh, which is yeah. pretty similar functionality if you want to They work that. really similar. If you know one, you can know the other. And we do explain in course two of the specialization, which is computer vision for engineering and science on Coursera. In course two, um, we, we actually tell you how to use the labeler app. You get to practice using it. Um, on the example in the video is, I think, labeling railroad crossing signs, and then you get to practice it finding lumber defects. Um, but yeah, it's y you get to practice using it. It's really easy to do. So um, this is, I'm, I'm not, I don't have a live demo of it, but if, uh, the doc page kind of gives you the idea of what you do. You, you draw your own labels. Uh, there's some actual, uh, in the video labeler, there's, there's some neat functionality to actually you know, try to estimate where the subsequent thing will be in the next frame and auto box it for you and stuff. It, yeah, there. so if it's close and, enough, uh, you don't have to individually label every single part of the video. It's very, very user-friendly, pretty intuitive. We've got videos on it, and there's good doc pages. So. Um, can we detect different things at the same time, like persons and cars? Yeah, there's a great example yeah. in the course where it's a person on a bicycle wearing a backpack, and it detects person, bicycle, and backpack, and they're all overlapping. Um, I could probably find it if I try. Yeah. Uh, labeling tool. Can MATLAB be used for sentiment analysis? MATLAB can be used for sentiment analysis of text for sure. In fact, we do that in another course of ours 
uh, <laughs> it's in a, uh, what is it? God, what's that one called? Practical Data, Practical science, data science with MATLAB with or Mat something. Lab. Yeah. Uh, it's another specialization we have on Coursera, and I, th I can't remember which course it is in, but I think it's probably the third course, Predictive Modeling and Machine uh, No, it might be course two. It's, it's somewhere it's in, in there. It's in that specialization. You can do sentiment analysis with text. Uh, we do it with Shakespeare's sonnets and, and some other things. I think you mean facial sentiment analysis, and I believe MATLAB can do that. Uh, I haven't tried I'm that. I'm sure you can. We should do that. We, we could find out, you know. I almost want to say one of these. Here. Yeah, there's a, there's a pre-trained model for that. Oh. Or you could hypothetically train your own if you have the time and uh, resources. I have used the facial detector a lot, which is very similar, where it basically looks for, that's face based on you know features it detects around the eyes, around the nose, around the mouth, and it can track one person's face over time. So that, you know, if you wanted to make your own sentiment analyzer instead of using the pre-trained one, that would be pretty useful for that. Um, what about... Uh, is it at all possible to use the NVIDIA models or Tau, cool, Tau Toolkit inside MATLAB? So I think you would have to deploy. I use don't know. What? We'll get back to you on that one. I don't know the specifics of NVIDIA models. I don't know that off the top of my head. Do you know that off the top of your head? Uh, I mean, the only thing that I think of with NVIDIA is that it makes the GPUs. Yeah. Uh, so is, if they're talking about, can we use NVIDIA GPUs, yes. Yeah. Uh, that's actually the only type of GPU we support is NVIDIA. Oh, well, that's, that's um, handy. And I'm if there's specific models they want to import, I've, I haven't heard of that, but uh, we do have some tools to import third-party models. Yeah. But I, we, I we have would have to get that. back to you on it. I mean, yeah, you'd have to ping yeah. us because yeah. I don't know exactly what you mean. Um, a license to run on an embedded system. Do you know anything about embedded systems? That's kind of out of my wheelhouse. Uh, there's not a license to run your model on an embedded system, but there would be a license to generate the code to uh, go on to the embedded system. Uh, but there's not a separate license to run it once it's there. Mm -hmm. You would just have your license to uh, generate uh, whatever GPU compatible code you needed. Uh, uh, what are, s oh, sorry. And then you could put it on your embedded system. Uh, what are the advantages of doing these real-time detection and tracking in MATLAB instead of the example in Python? I would say right off the top of my head, uh, MATLAB has support. And <laughs> so if you can't get it to work, you can contact someone at MathWorks and they can help you out. Uh, I have used that several times myself when I was figuring out these concepts for the first time. Um, it's all centralized and there's a lot more apps available in MATLAB that since most of Python kind of relies on third party, stuff doesn't get updated very much. There aren't, there isn't a lot of good app work. Um, so it's just, for me, it's an issue of availability, whether the code is super sketchy, which sometimes third-party Python packages can be, uh, and uh, ease of use. But you know, yeah, I, I would for your definitely for your you own. know plus one the support aspect and also just the larger product. It's not even just that there's apps. I mean, I, if you're doing research in a lab and all you really care about is one deep learning model, and, or you're going to make your own. I mean, hey, maybe you don't need MATLAB, but you know you could still use it. But if you're if you're a working professional or you're going to work with anybody else. Uh, what MATLAB offers you is this ecosystem. It's kind of a end-to-end -end product, right? Like you can do, uh, like I was mentioning, co you know, code gen. You can deploy. You can do testing. You, there, we have all sorts of other products and toolboxes that integrate very well with the deep learning toolbox. So you don't have to do any of your own work to get different things working together. We make sure they work for you, and then if they don't work for you, you contact us and we yeah. make them work for you. Uh, whereas you don't always, get, well, you don't get that kind of support most of the time with, with third-party stuff. Yeah. And there is something to be said for the MATLAB ecosystem and community. Uh, two of my first three research proce uh, projects, back when I was still a biomedical engineer, were somebody wrote this code that does something very specific in Python, and no one else at the university can use it. Megan, can you translate this into MATLAB? Unfortunately, this was before there was more code gener <laughs> generation capabilities, which now MATLAB can do a lot of that automatically. But um, a lot of what I was doing as an undergrad and grad student was, you know, putting it into more usable form, uh, using MATLAB's graphics user interface, things like that. And so there is some sort of back and forth, um, but it is helpful to have other people at the university be able to read and understand and use your code. And, and for a good section of industry, I'll just, I'll just say the word simulate. Yeah. Uh, we're not really doing it here, but all today. this computer vision stuff that we're doing, all the deep learning stuff that we're doing, you can do it within that modeling framework. Uh, you can do all the you know hardware in the loop, software in the loop, model in the loop, all your all your favorite uh, testing methodologies and model-based design stuff. Uh, have you tried your algorithm with objects that reflect itself? Windows, Silver Fridge, etc. Yeah. 
We didn't do it on purpose, but we were practicing a little bit yesterday uh, in a conference room, and uh, it does occasionally pick up reflections of us in the, in the window. Uh, uh, so we didn't have a window behind us today, but had, had there been human-looking reflections, the model would have most likely picked those up. It detected them, um, and then if we stayed moving, it, de it tracked the reflection as a different person. So it never mixed us up with the reflections. Yeah, yeah. But, but sometimes it, it did think the reflections were a person. And you saw that YOLO can detect mirrors. So uh, it is interesting. You could, if you wanted to get rid of those, you could tune your detection parameters to make those go away. Um, you could also tune your tracking parameter to make it a little less sensitive. So something has to be really persistent to get tracked um, if you wanted to get rid of the reflections. But uh, we actually thought the reflections were kind of cool because it's like, oh, it. it you know, we didn't get a chance to practice it, this with four people, and now we can. Um, let's see. And then there was a question about Julia, which I've never used Julia. I come from academia, so MATLAB is by far the most prevalent. But have you ever used Julia? No. Yeah. So Isn't it a graphics thing? That's about my level of familiarity with it. I thought it was uh, a package for visualizations. I didn't know that Julia had anything to do with computer vision or deep learning. Uh, but that's, but again, I guess neither of us can answer that Brandon question. Brandon has answered it, too, as he said that you can um, continue to, oh, no, that was with wind answer questions. Yeah. So uh, we'll have to get back to you on that one when we find someone who has more experience using Julia, because we haven't. <laughs> All right. Are there any more questions? Come on, guys. We are out of material, so we need you. Yeah, that's that's. We have now given you every piece of knowledge we possess. All right. Well, I guess then, if there are no more questions, we should wrap it up. Thank you guys right. so much for joining us for this live stream. Uh, we had a lot of fun, and we didn't run into each other at all. That was my biggest concern about this. Um, Again, this is an example we used live tracking with a webcam. In the course, you'll get to track all kinds of different things via videos. There's more going to be more about motion detection. There's uh, camera stabilization. There's a lot of cool stuff that we yep. didn't have time to go into today. And again, that's uh, on Coursera, Computer, Computer Vision for Engineering and Science. Um, and we really enjoyed having you here today. So thanks for showing up. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you.